Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Behind the Servants. Today's episode is going to be a special one for me. See, of all of the characters in Fate, and all of anime for that matter, Ushi to me stands at a tie for my favorite character of all time. This is one of the only times in a video formatted like this where I will say this. I am a massive simp for Ushi. She is perfect to me in every single way. As such, I wanted to know more about her real world counterpart. For the record, I am aware that she is a gender bend, and to me, that's fine. Ushi will always just be Ushi. But now let's look deeper into who Ushi Wakamaru is and the legends that surround him. As I tend to do, I'll begin with the history and then go into the legends. Let's start with this. Ushi's formal name is Minamoto no Yoshitsune, making him a descendant of the Minamoto clan that Raiko hails from. Hence, why when Ushi meets her in Kaldea, she is so awestruck. Ushi Wakamaru was simply the name that he went by during his childhood, meaning the young bull lad. As I have been calling Ushi, Ushi for as long as I have had her in game, I will not be changing that so bear with me. Ushi was born in the year 1159, the youngest of nine, to Minamoto no Yoshitomo. A year after his birth, the Heiji Rebellion broke out. This was a very brief civil war fought between clans of opposing political views. Classic. In this rebellion, Ushi's father and two older brothers would be killed but he managed to escape with his mother by fleeing to the capital. In some recountings, he and his mother were spared instead. Then, at the age of 10, he was given up to the Kurama Temple and raised by the monks there. One of these monks was Kichi Hogan, who taught Ushi the ways of swordsmanship. Let's take a brief side trip to explore Hogan. First off, Hogan is a title, not a name. A Hogan is a very revered monk, and his name translates to the first demon monk. Hogan was an Onmyoji much like our favorite clown, Ashiya Doman. He is also cited as being the creator of the Kyohachi Ryo, which are the eight styles of swordsmanship that are present across all of Western Japan. One of these styles was taught to Ushi Wakamaru. Ushi, being a conniving little thing, would also steal the Six Secret Teachings, which was a military manual written in the 11th century BC for ancient Chinese generals. This was something that had belonged to Hogan. He would study this to further his mind as a warrior. As Ushi grew up, he was at a crossroads in life. He could stay at the Kurama Temple and become a monk, living a peaceful life of teaching and prayer, or he could go forth and use what he learned under Hogan. Ushi decided for the latter and would leave the temple and follow a gold merchant who was an acquaintance of his father to Hiraizumi in the Mutsu Prefecture in the year 1174. The same year, at the age of 15, he would fight against the bandit chief Kumasaka. Ushi, being smaller and younger than the chief, seemed to have no chance in the fight, but prevailed easily slaying the beast of a man. Ushi would take residence with the regional lord Fujiwara no Hidehira. Sometime between the years 1174 and 1180, Ushi would have his faithful encounter with Benkei on the Moonlit Bridge. Before we get into that encounter, let me give you a little bit of a background on Benkei. He was also a legendary figure in Japanese history. The circumstances of his birth are unknown, with speculation about him being the bastard son of a blacksmith's daughter who was raped, the child of a temple god, or that he was actually just an oni. In fact, his childhood nickname was Oni Wakamaru, or Demon Child. While most of his childhood is unknown, we do know that he joined a Buddhist temple and became a monk at a young age. As was the style of the time, monks were trained in the ways of military warfare, usually with the Naginata. However, Benkei is known for his use of seven additional weapons. His sword, a broadaxe, a rake, a sickle, a mallet, an iron staff, and a saw, as well as the Naginata. At the age of 17, Benkei left his temple and joined a sect of mountain ascetics, called the Yamabushi. Benkei would then set out on a journey of his own. Each night he would look for swordsmen to challenge with the hopes of defeating 1,000 swordsmen in a duel, and if he would win, he would take their sword as his prize. After 999 victories, he happened upon a young man playing the flute at the Goto Engine Shrine. He challenged the short lad to a duel, and he accepted. For reference, Benkei was said to be 6 foot 6 or 198 centimeters tall. This young man agreed despite this, and they agreed to duel on the Gojo Bridge in the Moonlight. The fight in the Moonlight ultimately resulted in Benkei's loss in the smaller warrior, Ushiwakamaru's victory. Benkei was unable to accept the loss, and waited another night for Ushu to show up at the Kiyomizu Temple to challenge him again. He did so, and lost once more. With the second loss, Benkei conceded that Ushi was the superior swordsman, and offered to be his retainer. In the year 1180, Ushi's brother Yoritomo, who was now the acting head of the Minamoto clan, was beginning to raise an army to battle against the Taira. This was the beginning of the Genpei War. The Genpei War was the final result of a decades-long grudge. The Minamoto and the Taira were at constant odds with each other, with both sides attempting to gain imperial control. I will preface this the same way that I preface every major conflict that I cover in the series. Very rarely is history black and white. In war especially, there's an innumerable amount of grey areas. Threads of reasoning for conflict are like the mycelia of a fungus, so who can say who is definitively right or wrong in the conflict? Remember, 
On the opposite side of this war is Tomoe Gozen. The match that lit the roaring flame was when Taira no Kiyomori put his infant son up as the heir of the Emperor's ship after Emperor Takakura abdicated the throne. His son, named Antoku, reigned as Emperor of Japan for five years, between the ages of two and seven. The former Emperor, Go Shirakawa's son, Mochihito, was rightfully upset with this placement, believing that he had been denied his birthright. As a result, he rallied the Minamoto clan against the Taira. This, of course, only caused further conflict in the Genpei War would officially begin after Taira no Kiyomori sent his troops to capture Mochitomo, which they did, and executed him. Minamoto no Yoritomo began going around Japan recruiting people to his cause. Of these, Ushiwakamaru, Benkei, and another brother of both Ushi and Yoritomo, Minamoto no Noriyori, joined the cause. So there's an interesting note to be found from this meeting. In my research, it is stated that Ushi had never met either of his brothers since they were all split, and Ushi was so young that it would have been impossible for him to remember who his brother was. A large part of Ushi's character in Fate Grand Order is that she loves her brother above just about everyone else, at least until her voice lines are updated. Her relationship to her brother seems to be lackluster at best in real life, and any form of respect that he may have had for him in real life would have been exclusively as a military leader. Sorry, side tangent. Ushi and Benkei would be members of several key battles during the Genpei War. It is stated that Benkei slew over 200 warriors in every single fight he was a participant in. They would also be present at the Battle of Awazu, which is where Tomoe goes in and her husband supposedly met their end. Or at the very least we know Tomoe's husband did. For his efforts, Ushi was recognized for his military genius and promoted to the rank of general. In 1185, he was at the Battle of Don no Ura, which was a naval battle. Ushi would lead the Minamoto naval forces against the Taira, who held a strategic ground with tides in their favor for the first part of the day. The Taira plan was pretty simple. Defeat the Minamoto before the day's end, or else the tide would be against them. The Minamoto held strong throughout the day, and at night took advantage of their new and natural ally. The Taira also made the mistake of having the young Emperor Antoku aboard along with other nobles who thought this was going to be an easy victory. However, a senior Taira officer defected seeing that the tides of war and the water were against them, allowing for the Minamoto to identify which boat held the nobility. They turned their fire upon them as a result, and the mass suicide of the Taira nobles ensued. There's a famous anecdote that they had some of Japan's sacred treasures with them, namely the sacred mirror, and that when it was thrown overboard, the person who threw it looked directly into it and died immediately. Also, the sacred sword was thrown overboard, but somehow miraculously found its way to shore. Famously, Ushi was known to perform the eight-boat leap during this battle in an attempt to escape a pursuing warrior and to get to a more advantageous spot to fight against them. He leapt across several enemy naval vessels in full armor and completely armed. With this, the Genpei War concluded and the Minamoto clan gained control of Japan. All seemed to be looking up for Ushi, and he was granted several titles, such as the Governor of Iyo and others given to him by the former Emperor Go Shirakawa. Despite this, Ushi's brother, Yoritomo, would deny him these titles. His brother would become hostile to him after this, and, seeking allies, Ushi would ask his uncle, Minamoto no Yuki, for help in the event that Yoritomo tried to pull anything. Yoritomo caught wind of this and immediately attempted to capture his brother. Ushi and Benkei would flee to Hiraizumi, receiving protection from the Lord just as he had when he was a child. This was fine for a while until Hidehira passed. He had his son, Yasuhira, swear to continue to protect Ushi, but ultimately he gave in to Yoritomo's demands. This betrayal resulted in Yasuhira's troops surrounding the castle and killing off all of Ushi's retainers, including Benkei, who is famed for having died standing up. In fact, I believe that Benkei's final ascension art in-game is actually him dead, full of arrows and bleeding, but still having the will to fight. Ushi would commit seppuku inside the castle. His head would be removed and preserved in sake, then sent to his brother as proof of his demise. Today, his final resting place is the Shirahata Jinja Shrine. That is the historical Ushi, a warrior who led his clan to victory and successfully conquered Japan, all in the name of the Minamoto. He is remembered in Japan as a victim of betrayal and as one of the most famed samurai to have ever lived but there's more to him than just the historical record. One of the more curious aspects of Uji's design and fate, as well as other works for that matter, has to do with the Tengu. Tengu are bird demons of Japanese myth. They are easily recognizable from their beaks or by their bright red faces with long noses. Ushi is often associated with the Tengu because of his being raised on Mount Kurama. In one instance of his myth, he is not taught by Kichi Hogan, but Sojobo, the Dai Tengu of Mount Kurama, which means the head Tengu. It is said that because of his mystical training, Ushi was able to leap incredibly high and far, and his proficiency in the martial arts was due to this training as well. It is unknown to me and my research as to why Sojobo would decide to teach a human how to be a warrior, but honestly, this just seems to happen a lot in Japanese legends. 
The tales of Ushiwakamaru and Benkei have also become the topics of several kabuki plays. A popular subject for these is their travels together, as well as their fateful meeting on the bridge. One that I was personally interested in comes to us from the 3 star CE as well as Benkei's third skill. It shows us a scene from their travels where they are stopped at a checkpoint while being disguised as Yamabushi. They tell the noble who stopped them that they are collecting donations for their temple, and in such, the noble only becomes more suspicious. Thinking quickly, Benkei produces a blank scroll and begins reading off names that are just not there. To prevent others from noticing the farce, he feigns poor eyesight and presses his face to the paper. It is played as a fairly lighthearted interaction, but this is the usual theme for their kabuki appearances. Now, I'm going to simp for a bit, so if you just wanted to hear the history lesson, thank you for tuning in. Alright, Ushi is one of the most beloved samurai in Japanese history, being a sympathetic character who was betrayed. This trend continues in Fate as she is one of the more beloved free characters in the game. She is perfect. Cute, smart, and funny, but also deadly, usable, and effective. She is the very first character I grailed to 100 because I had the epiphany that she just deserves it. She will be my first 120 when that comes to NA as well. She is a representation of loyalty, completely unwavering in-game and in real life. Her legend has her pinned as a fun-loving Tengu girl who only ever wanted to be told that you were proud of her. Cheers to Ushi, the very best girl. But that's it. Thank you all so much for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed it. If you would like to request a certain servant for me to cover, let me know in the comments. Like the videos, it really does help out the channel. Subscribe to catch these as they go up. Follow my Twitch for significantly less structured content. I also have a Twitter, but for now, keep your chin up. Peace.